Welcome back to thecloudchurch.org. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist and Spanish and English speaking people. And we've been going through this in our Why I Am Not series, looking at why I personally am not a member of this or that denomination. We started our series on why I am not a Calvinist, why I do not follow the teaching of Calvinism. And then I made a video on why I am not a Pentecostal, and why I personally choose not to associate or be a part of that denomination. Well, today I'm going to look at why I am not a Roman Catholic, why I am not a Roman Catholic. Now, let me just say from the get-go, I'm not attacking anyone or their religion. Each one of these videos in the Why I'm Not series is just so you can know why I personally choose not to be a part of that religion. It's a personal conviction, if you will. And the reason I choose not to join is because I'm a Bible believer. I believe to follow the Bible. So everything that I look at and I scrutinize and I study, I always go to the Bible to see, okay, does that line up with the Scripture? Does that line up with what the Bible really teaches? And if a denomination says one thing and the Bible says something else, I will always follow the Word of God. Because I believe everything that God ever wanted us to know is in the Bible. And by Bible, I mean the King James 1611 Authorized Version. All right, so why I am not a Roman Catholic? Why I am not a Roman Catholic? There are countless many Catholics today in the world. I believe it's the second largest religion in the world. The first being, of course, Islam, which means submission. Why I'm not a Catholic? There are many, many, many Catholics that have that religion. And in that religion, they say that they're the right religion and everyone else is wrong. And a matter of fact, one of their favorite sayings in the Roman Catholic religion is, this is what they all say, there is no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Is that true? Is salvation only in a church and only through that church and the teachings of that church you can be saved and get to heaven? Is that true? Well, let's start off today with 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And I'm going to read 15 and 16. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. The Apostle Paul is writing here to Timothy. And he says, That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So I guess there is salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. It's through the Scriptures. It's through the Bible. For this verse teaches that through the Scriptures we may be able to be wise unto salvation through faith. We're saved by faith, the Bible teaches. Now, I like verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is it pro and it and let me let me say that over, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then it says verse 13 that the man of God may be perfect, thorough, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, according to the Bible, you can be saved outside of any church. You can be saved through the Scriptures they make you wise into salvation. For they show that it is through faith in Jesus Christ that you can be saved. But also, it says the Scripture is given for doctrine. Our doctrine should come from the Scriptures, not from a denomination that attempts to, to teach what they believe you should believe. And as we'll see, as I've studied the, the Roman Catholic Church, I found a lot of things that the Catholic Church preach and teach are tradition. And in some ways, they, they don't they don't follow the scriptures. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you why I personally am not a Catholic. We're going to look at Catholicism on one hand and the Bible on the other. And let's see if they agree. Do they agree? Does the Bible teach Catholicism? Or is Catholicism a religion that teaches certain doctrines that are outside of the Bible? So this is why I personally am not a Roman Catholic. Now if you are, help yourself. Be a Roman Catholic. But it wouldn't hurt to watch and see why I'm not. I'm not saying you don't have to be. If you want to continue being a Catholic, help yourself. It's a free country. You have the right to believe your own religion. But you should also study. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are commanded in the Bible to study the word of God. We are commanded to prove all things, hold that fast that which is good. So today, we're going to take the Bible and look at Roman Catholicism, and see, do they agree? Are they the same? Well, the first reason that I personally choose not to be a Roman Catholic is because of the history of Catholicism. I've studied out the Catholic Church, and I found out that the Catholic Church really just 
started in about 300 years after Jesus. Now I know what they teach. They, they teach that the Catholic Church started with Peter. And we'll look at that and see if that's true according to the Bible. But when you look at history and you look at the truth of history, you find out that way out here at about 325 A.D., there was a guy named Constantine. And Constantine in 325 A.D. is really the one that set up Constantine. I don't know, spelled his name wrong. Constantine. There we go. Is really the one that set up the Roman Catholic Church and joined the state with the church. Constantine was the one that claimed he saw this up in heaven. And he saw this sign. And that sign, he said, in hoc vincis. vincis. And he said he, he saw a sign in heaven and he had accepted the, the so-called Christian religion. And he, as an emperor, joined Catholicism with the state. Now, I know that Catholics don't, don't teach that, but if you look at history, that's exactly what happened. Because Catholics say, no, 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 the first pope was Peter. Really? Okay, well, let's look at what the Bible says about Peter and if he is really a pope. And if it does line up with what they teach. Because as I studied out history, this is what I found, that it really didn't start until 325 A.D. with Constantine, who set up the first uh, joining or melding of church and state together. And he started a Catholic church. Catholic means universal, or all, everyone together. And it was during this time of Constantine that he made all people come together and claim to be Christians. Even pagans had to convert to Catholicism. And they did. Now, the Catholic Church, as I stated, says that Peter was the first one. And Peter, Peter was actually the first pope. And they believe that the foundation of the Catholic Church is Peter. And he is the first. And they get that from Matthew chapter 16. So let's look at Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, we have Jesus Christ here talking to his disciples. And he's telling about his church and how he's going to start his church. And what Catholics do is they read, and they only read part of the passage. They love to go to Matthew chapter 16, and they love to read only verses 18 and 19. So let's read verses 18 and 19. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And they say that Jesus was standing here, and Jesus was talking to Peter. And they say when Jesus was talking, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and they say the rock is Peter, I will build my church. So the whole foundation of the Catholic Church is on Peter. And they say Peter is the rock. But is that is that right? Is that is Peter the rock? You see, when I read that passage, I don't see that. I see Jesus speaking and he says, Thou art Peter. But then Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. See, the rock isn't Peter. The rock is Jesus. You say, can you prove that from the Bible? Well, yeah, if I do, that pretty much uh, undoes the entire Catholic system, doesn't it? Well, matter of fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, without a doubt, the Bible tells us who the rock is. And it's not Peter. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse... 3 and 4, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. It's talking about Moses and how they left Egypt in the Old Testament. And verse 4, they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank the, of that spiritual rock. And notice it's a capital R. Hmm. That followed them, and that rock was Christ. So according to the Bible, the rock is Jesus. Jesus is the rock. So to say that Peter is the rock is to steal glory from Jesus Christ, is it not? Because Jesus said, upon this rock himself, I will build my church. And what did Jesus Christ do? He built his church. So who built the church? Well, it's Jesus' church. It's not Peter's church. It's Jesus' church. And as we look in the Bible, the church is called the body of Christ. Notice it's not called the body of Peter. So is Peter the first one in... Well, is Peter who built the church? Well, the Roman Catholics will tell you, yes, yes he is. But look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 2 and 18, we clearly see that the church was started on Jesus, who is the rock. In Ephesians 2, 18 through 20. Ephesians 2, 18 through 20 says, For though... 
For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the house of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Well, Peter was an apostle. Yeah, there were many apostles. And it says, Jesus Christ being himself, being the chief cornerstone. So who started the church? Who is the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the rock. What is the cornerstone? It's a rock. So Jesus Christ is the rock. He is the one who started the church. But once again they say, no, 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 it's Peter. Well, let's go back to, to Matthew chapter 16 and look at the context. In context, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And Jesus asks his disciples, whom say that, that I am? That's verse 13. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they answered in verse 14, some said this and some said others. And 15 says, he saith unto him, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. And Jesus Christ started a church on himself, as we just read in Ephesians. Himself being the chief cornerstone. And then verse 17 says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Peter, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It's not upon Peter that he built the church, because the rock is Christ. But then he says to Peter, But I will give you the gates, uh, the, the keys, and things like that. So, yes, Peter would have been the one that helped start the church, but the church was founded on Christ, not on Peter. But I want you to look at this. In this same passage, not a few verses later, look at what Jesus says about Peter. The Catholic Church says the first pope was Peter. Well, if he was the first pope, look at what Jesus says to the first pope in the same passage. And then it says there in um, verse 20, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Verse 22 says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So Jesus Christ is telling Peter, This is what's going to happen to me. And Peter, the first pope, according to them, rebukes Jesus Christ. What? Why would he rebuke Jesus, the Son of God? God manifest in the flesh. Well, look at verse 23. But he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. Jesus Christ called Peter Satan. <laughs> so Jesus called the first pope, according to the Catholics, Satan. Wow, that doesn't, that doesn't sit too well, does it? But yet that's what the scriptures say. Hmm, isn't that interesting? You've got a problem if you try to make the church start on Peter. Now, the truth of the scriptures is that God sent Peter to start the church, but then later God used Paul, and that the church started with Jews, and then it changed over to Gentiles. And we who are Christians today, according to Romans 11, 13, are to follow Paul. Three times in the scriptures, Paul says, follow me. So why is the Catholic Church trying to follow Peter instead of Paul? Peter was the apostle to the Jews. There were two keys listed. This was the first key, was to Jews. And there was another key, to Gentiles. And those who are saved today in the church are Gentiles, not Jews. So there's a transition in the book of Acts. Go to thecloudchurch.org and look under Bible studies. On, on a Bible study, a video that I made not too long ago about the transition or study, understanding the book of Acts and the transition of Acts and how it changes from Peter to Paul. And today, the books of Romans through Philemon are the books of Paul. And God used Paul for us today. So, did the church start with Peter? Was Peter the first pope? Well, if he was, the first pope was called Satan by Jesus just a few verses after. You got a problem. You got a problem. So, also let me say this. The Roman Catholic Church also teaches that Peter, as the very first pope, went to Rome. But yet you have a problem. In the Bible, not one time, never in the Bible, do we ever find Peter going to Rome. Peter never went to Rome, but you know who did go to Rome? Paul. Paul went to Rome. Matter of fact, I believe it was the Romans who killed them. So where did Peter go? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 5, 
in verse 13, we find that Peter was never in Rome. He was in somewhere else. In 5.13 of 1 Peter, the Bible says, The church that is Babylon, in, that is at Babylon, elect together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Old Peter went to Babylon. He didn't go to Rome. Paul went to Rome. But yet Catholics call themselves the Roman Catholic Church, and they say the first pope was Peter, and they say he went to Rome. Yet as we study history, we find there were true Christians all the way up to about 325 A.D. who were following Paul instead of Peter. And then this guy set up his own state religion and forced people to believe that Peter was the first pope and that he went to Rome even though he went to Babylon. Catholics have the wrong foundation and the wrong apostle. Their foundation is Peter when the Bible says the foundation is Christ. And they want to follow the apostle Peter when according to the scriptures, we're to follow the Apostle Paul today. Go to cloudchurch.org and go to past sermons, and you'll see a couple videos there on the ministry of Paul versus the ministry of Peter and Paul's ministry. And it explains very well how God transitioned from Peter, who went and preached more to Jews, to Paul, who was called more to Gentiles. And how there was a transition in the book of Acts from being saved the way Peter preached, water baptism, to being saved simply by trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you what the gospel is in a little bit. The gospel is salvation by grace through faith. And yet that's another thing. The Catholic Church says you're saved by works. When the Bible says you're saved by faith. Peter versus Paul. Which one? Which one do we follow today? According to the Bible, we're under the ministry of Paul. But that's a different story. So, why am I not a Roman Catholic? Because I believe the Bible. I've studied the history. I see in the Bible that some of the things they teach are not what the Bible teaches. So that's one of the reasons why I choose not to be a Roman Catholic. The other reason that I can't be a Roman Catholic is that I can't follow a man. I can't worship a man. I don't believe it's correct to worship a man. Catholics say that Peter was the first pope. Was he really? Well, Let's look at that in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14. If that's true, then the way that uh, Peter lived his life was very different from the way that uh, popes today live their lives. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he healed the guy. He didn't have any money. When you look at popes today, oh, they have elaborate costumes. And they're all gold, many made with gold thread, with gold... Uh, they're some of the richest people in the world, are the popes. They have more money than they know what to do with. Their, their gold and silver is everywhere on display around them. Well, that's not Peter. Peter was poor. He had nothing. In Matthew chapter 8, and verse 14, we see another thing about Peter. Because today, popes are supposed to be unmarried. So if you're a pope, you cannot get married according to the Catholic Church. Well, guess what? Peter does not make a very good pope. Because look at this verse. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14. And when Jesus was come unto Peter's house and saw his wife's mother laid and sick of fever. Huh? What? He saw Peter's wife's mother. That means Peter was married. Not a very good first pope. Because the Catholic Church teaches you cannot be married if you're a pope. And yet, Peter was married. Matter of fact, let's look at another verse that shows that. Luke 4.38. Luke chapter 4 and verse 38. I can't be a Roman Catholic because I read the Bible. And I see some of the things they say is not what the Bible teaches. Um, here we are in, in Luke 4.38. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. Who is Simon? It's Peter. Peter's name is Simon Peter. He's also called Cephas. Has three different names. Simon's wife. Peter's wife. Peter was married. Doesn't make a very good uh, pope, does he, if he was married. Acts chapter 10. Another thing about Peter is he refused to worship a man. And when people came to him, the first pope, according to the Catholic Church, he said, get up, don't, don't worship me. I'm just a man. So he refused worship. Well, popes throughout the centuries have, have asked for worship. They've made people come down and kiss their ring and, and kneel at their feet. People worship the pope as though he was the Lord himself. 
here on earth. But yet Peter didn't want any worship. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 25 and 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. When's the last time you saw the Pope, when someone comes down and bows before him, say, No, psh, get up, no, dog, no, don't you dare do that. I'm just a man like you. Don't you worship me. Stand up, stand up, stand up. You never have and you never will. Popes love the worship of man. And men worship popes. There's a reason that, pe that popes ask for worship. It's because the popes have held, uh, different hats. I think there's five or six different hats. And one of the hats of the pope says, Vicarius Filii Diem, or D, or however you pronounce Latin. It says, in the place of God. So the Pope is boldly proclaiming to the world with his hat, I am here in the place of God himself. And that's why Popes say, worship me. Because if you worship me, it's just as if you're worshiping God. Because I am God here on earth. That's what Popes believe. Well, interestingly enough, if you take that Latin, Vicarius Fidium, or however you pronounce it, and you turn it into Roman numerals, you know what number comes out? It's uncanny. It's very weird how those three words in Latin, if you take all the numer Roman numerals, come out to six, six, six. Total up all those Roman numerals and it comes out to 666. I seem to remember somewhere in the Bible that, was it the beast or the Antichrist had on his forehead the names of blasphemies? Hmm, something to that effect. Well, maybe that's something else. But anyway, it's kind of funny that here are some Roman centurions. A man named Cornelius, a Roman, comes before Peter, what they say is the first pope, and falls down to worship him. And the first pope wasn't a very good pope. He was married, and he didn't receive worship. So Peter's not looking like a very good pope. Either that, or else he's the greatest pope that ever lived, and all popes after him are a bunch of evil people who didn't follow his example. I'm just saying. So I cannot be a Roman Catholic because I can't follow Peter. I can't worship the Pope. I have to follow the Word of God. And if I was to follow Peter, I find out that Peter is very different from the Popes of today. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9. You know another thing that the Pope does? The Pope says, call me Holy Father. And if you were to go and visit the Pope today, he would say, call me Holy Father. You know what? We have a problem. The Pope's not my father. <laughs> I'm not supposed to call anyone father. And in Matthew 23, 9, the Bible says, And call no man on earth your father, and call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So Jesus Christ is commanding me and tells me, Don't call anyone on earth your father. He says there's one father in heaven. So this term, Holy Father, does not apply to the Pope. Holy Father, that's God in heaven. Why would a man here on earth tell you to call him the title of God? Well, it's like he told you he had on his forehead. Vicarius Fidelium. And he tells people, I am here in the place of God, so worship me as God. I can't do it. I can't be a Roman Catholic because I cannot call a man on earth my father. I can't call him God. Go to um, John 17, 11. John 17, 11. Look at what Jesus says. Does Jesus ever call a man here on earth father? No. He instructs us not to. And here Jesus is praying in John 17, 11, and Jesus says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Jesus Christ is praying to God the Father, and he calls Jesus Christ Holy Father. Jesus wasn't praying to the Pope, was he? Was Jesus praying to Peter? Was Peter the first Holy Father? No, the Holy Father is in heaven. So another reason that I can't be a Pope, or excuse me, that I can't be a Catholic, is that I cannot worship a man. I cannot call a man my God, my Holy Father. Another reason that I can't be a Catholic, I can't because I have to follow the Bible rather than tradition. Almost everything the Catholic Church teaches is tradition, and as we've seen, it's tradition that's not Bible. It's outside of the Bible. Tradition says that Peter was the first pope. Well, if he was, he's very different from those today. Tradition says that he went to Rome when the Bible says he went to Babylon. 
Tradition says that he was single, and all popes have to be single and never married, and Peter was married. Tradition says you must worship the Pope. Peter said, don't worship me. I'm just a man like you. Tradition says, call him Holy Father. When the Bible says that's the name of God, I can't follow tradition. Let's go to Mark chapter 7. What does the Bible say about tradition? What's interesting is before Jesus showed up, and when he showed up, there were people in charge who were a bunch of priests. And all these priests hated Jesus. And it was the priest that killed Jesus Christ. And interesting enough, the Catholic Church is full of priests. Hmm. And these priests were apostates. And they were evil. Jesus called them hypocrites and liars. And he said that they had tradition rather than following the scriptures. Church. What is, uh, what is Mark chapter uh, 7 verse 6 say? Mark 7, 6 tells us about these Old Testament priests. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. They were teaching man's teachings rather than the Bible's teachings. Almost sounds like what the Catholic Church does today. I'll continue reading. For laying aside the commandments of God, they hold the tradition of man as the washing of pots and cups and many other things, such things like do ye. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And then verse 9, 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered, and many such things do ye. So the Roman Catholic Church has a lot of tradition, and they choose to follow tradition rather than the Bible. But the Bible says tradition makes the word of God of none effect. So for me, I choose the word of God rather than tradition. Because traditions being taught and believed make the Bible of none effect. So you have to make a choice. Will I follow the Bible, or will I follow man's traditions? Well, to follow man's traditions, you have to do what they did. Lay aside the commandments of God and follow man rather than God. No, I choose to follow God. Well, Catholics choose to follow tradition rather than the Bible. And by so doing, they've come up with a lot of different teachings and doctrines that are not biblical. For example, the first one is the priesthood. They say that priests cannot be married. So they teach that priests, popes and priests, cannot marry. Is that in the Bible? Does the Bible teach celibacy? Does the Bible tell us that if you determine to be a priest, then you cannot get married? Let's look at some verses. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're just looking at what Catholicism teaches and what the Bible says. And when I did that, I decided, you know what? I, I personally cannot be a Catholic. And I'm telling you why I can't be a Catholic. It's because the Bible says one thing and Catholicism says another and I choose the Bible. First Timothy, Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 say this. This is a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop. What's a bishop? It's a pastor. It's a, a person who's a, a, a head of a flock which is what the priest claimed to be. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. What? It must be the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, not given to wine, nor striker. And then in verse 4 it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So the Catholic Church says, if you're a priest, you can't be married. So they say all priests must be celibate. And then yet the Bible says, if you desire to be a bishop, a pastor of a flock, you have to have one wife. You should be married to one wife. Uh, something does not compute here. The Bible says one thing, Catholicism says another. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then there's a semicolon. Doctrines of devils. What are the doctrines of devils? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be given with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Huh? Forbidding to marry? Isn't that what celibacy is? Telling priests not to marry? Well, yeah. And yet in the context, the Bible says that's a doctrine of devil, telling people you can't get married. When the Bible says if you desire 
to be a spiritual head of a church, then you should be married. So something's wrong here. And it says abstain from meats. Abstain from meats. Who goes around telling people not to eat meat? Well, you know what? I, my wife's family was Catholic, and I, I remember them saying that there were certain times of the year where the Catholic Church says you can't eat meat on, is it meat on Friday or something? Huh. The only church that I've ever known throughout history that's ever said you can't get married, you shouldn't eat meats, was the Catholic Church. They forbid to marry and command you to abstain from meats. Why? Where is that in the Bible? Matter of fact, even Peter said that God appeared to him and said, kill and eat. There were meats that he could eat. So why would people want to tell you that you can't? Interesting. So the priests teach celibacy. And guess what? Celibacy is not a Bible doctrine, it's a man doctrine. So, so much for that one. Let's look at another one. What about the teaching of Mary? Let's put this down here. A perpetual virgin. Virgin. And they say Mary is sinless, never sinned. They call that the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Well, the Catholic Church teaches us that Mary was sinless and a perpetual virgin. And after she had Jesus Christ, she never had sex, never had any other children. She was always a virgin. And they tell us that she was sinless and she never sinned one time. Let's look at what the Bible says about this. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that Mary was, just like every other person that ever lived, a sinner. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 22, it says, When the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him with the Lord. Well, Jesus was born in the preceding verses. And after Jesus Christ was born, they took Mary to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice according to the law of Moses. And in verse 23, it says, As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So they did what the law commanded. It, uh, commanded. They gave sacrifice. And guess who, was sac who gave sacrifice? Mary gave sacrifice for her sins. So Mary was a sinner. Otherwise she wouldn't have had to give a sacrifice. What were the sacrifices for? For sin. Look down there in verse... Uh, Verse 38, And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. So of course, Jesus Christ came, and Jesus came for redemption. So salvation is through Jesus. Redemption is through Jesus Christ. Yet the Catholic Church says it's also through Mary. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church says that she is the co-mediator or co-mediatrix and that in fact, according to the Catholic Church, there are two mediators, Jesus and Mary. Is that true? Is that true? 1 Timothy 2.5, look at what the Bible teaches. Who is the mediator? Can you get to heaven through Mary? Or is getting to heaven only through Jesus Christ? Well, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So Jesus Christ is the mediator. Why would they try to make Mary a co-mediator when the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man? The one mediator is Jesus Christ. So we have a problem if we follow the Catholic Church. They try to make Mary sinless. Well, look at what Mary said in Luke chapter 1 and verse 46. Luke chapter 1 and verse 46, Mary says, confesses from her own mouth that she needs a Savior. Why would you need a Savior unless you were a sinner? We've already looked at, according to the law, when a woman gave birth she had to a male, she had to offer a sacrifice for her purification of her sins. Well, in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47, it says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary said that God is my Savior. What is she saying? She's saying that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And that's what Jesus came to do, to save. So it's not right to say that you can be saved by Mary. There's no verse in the Bible that teaches that Mary is a mediator and that Mary can save and redeem you. It's not in the Bible.
It's tradition outside of the Bible. Let me show you another tradition outside of the Bible. Go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 1 verse 25. So was Mary a sinner? Yeah, according to the Bible. Actually, according to her own mouth, she confessed, I am trusting in God, my Savior. So according to her own mouth, Mary was a sinner. So Mary C. was a sinner. Was Mary a perpetual virgin? Well, let's look at that. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 25. And it's talking about Joseph. And it says, And he knew her not till she brought first her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Now we all know the story that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And Mary was a virgin. When Jesus came out of Mary, the father was God. Joseph had not had sex with Mary yet. But as we read through the Bible, you know what we find out? We find that Joseph, when he married Mary, had more children. What? That's blasphemy. Oh, I can't believe that. Well, let's look at the Bible. Because the Catholic Church says, nope, she's a perpetual virgin. She was once a virgin, and she's always stayed a virgin. She was sinless and never had sex. What does the Bible teach? Let's go to, uh, and this might shock some people. Many people in the Catholic Church have heard the tradition for so long that they've never actually read the Bible for themselves. Well, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55 says, Matthew 13, 55, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not, is not his mother called Mary? And watch this. And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? So the Bible gives a list of the brothers and sisters of Jesus. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. At least four brothers that Jesus had. And then it says sisters, plural. So at least two. So Mary had at least seven children. So she was not a perpetual virgin. Mary had at least seven kids all total, including, including Jesus Christ. Does that sound like a perpetual virgin? As a matter of fact, if the Bible's true, and I believe it is, then that's more of a miracle than her just having Jesus. If she is indeed a perpetual virgin, then she must have had the other six kids without ever knowing Joseph either. So poor Joseph, he married Mary and never had sex with her. And yet Mary was able to give birth to seven children miraculously. No, no, it doesn't work, does it? No, obviously God, because, he, uh, because Joseph let Mary have God's baby, then Joseph afterwards was able to marry his wife and have her. And he had six kids with her, at the very least. There might have been three daughters, maybe eight kids. So Mary most definitely was not a perpetual virgin. It's impossible to make Mary into a perpetual virgin. She was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus Christ. No doubt, the Bible teaches that. But she did not stay a virgin. Yet according to the Catholic Church, she is still a virgin today. Go to Mark chapter 6 and verse 3 and 4. Mark 6, 3 and 4, again, talking about what we just read. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Guess what? Again, we have a list of the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. So Mary did have other children. As a matter of fact, go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 9. The Bible even tells us that the brother of Jesus was James. And James was pretty prominent in the early church. And because of that, he had his head cut off in the book of Acts. They killed him. He was probably the first bishop or pastor of the early church. But in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. So was Mary a perpetual virgin? No. Was Mary sinless? No. Once again, the Catholic Church has taught something that is tradition, but that's not in the Bible. Hmm, why do they do that? Why do they teach things that aren't true? Another thing the Catholic Church teaches is the Mass, which the Bible talks very little about. There's a thing called the Lord's Supper, but they make this a sacrament. And the Catholic Church says, and I've read many of their documents, many of their old books, talked to many of them, they literally believe that in the Mass, they pull Jesus Christ down from heaven and force him into a little wafer. 
and that when you eat that wafer, you are literally eating Jesus Christ. Hmm. Why do they teach that? Well, they say, well, it comes from John. And in the book of John, it tells us to do that. Well, in the book of John, Jesus says, the flesh profit is nothing. It's the words that I say unto you. They are spirit and they are life. Jesus Christ is saying, take, eat, this is my body. And as you eat it, it's a type of taking by faith Jesus as your Savior. It's got nothing to do with literally eating Jesus. But yet they call this transubstantiation. And they literally teach that they can pull God, they have the power to pull Jesus Christ out of heaven and force him into a little wafer and a little cup of wine. But what does the Bible say about that? Well, let's go to the book of Hebrews. What they also teach is that every time they do that, they are celebrating the death and burial of Jesus Christ over and over and over again. So every time they celebrate the Mass, they will tell you that they are sacrificing Jesus again. And you have to go to the Mass for the forgiveness of sin. So you go to Mass and you take the Mass and you're forgiven. But does the Bible teach that? How many sacrifices, how many times did Jesus die on the cross? Well, according to Catholics, every time they do the Mass, he dies on the cross again. But according to the Bible, how many times did Jesus die? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Never. So the Mass can't take away your sins. In verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Once offered for sins. Jesus Christ died once. Look at 1 Peter 3, 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So how many times did Jesus die? Well, according to the Catholic Church, Jesus Christ in the, in the Mass dies many times, and they actually kill him in the Mass, as it's a sacrifice of Jesus Christ again and again and again. But according to the Bible, no, Jesus Christ died once, for all. And it's that one sacrifice that is sufficient for all sins. So Jesus need not die again. So why are they killing him again? They kill Jesus in the Mass according to their own teachings. They say they literally pull him down and offer him and sacrifice him again. Well, who sacrificed Jesus to begin with? A bunch of priests who were a bunch of Pharisees and hypocrites and liars. So what is the Catholic Church trying to do? The same thing that their forefathers did, kill Jesus over and over and over again. That's probably the strongest reason why I cannot be a Roman Catholic. Because I cannot believe in the mess, um, excuse me, the mass. Because I cannot believe Jesus could die over and over and over and over and over every time they do it. I read the Bible, I see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ once. And it's through that one sacrifice forever for all sins that I have forgiveness. I think it's blasphemous to try to say we can kill Jesus over and over and over and over again. But yet that's what Catholicism teaches. If you don't believe me, go look at their own writings. Uh, Hebrews 10, 14, it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sacrificed, or excuse me, that are sanctified. By one offering forever all sins are forgiven to those who believe. And yet the Catholic Church says, no, through transubstantiation, we have to do it over and over and over and over again. You see, this isn't something to take lightly. All throughout history, there's been the fight between Catholics and true Christians. There's been a thing called the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition. And people were literally burned at the stake for what I'm telling you about right now. I've read many of the old Spanish uh, Protestant reformers, I love uh, Spanish things, of the 14, 15, and 1600s, and how they had to flee for their life from the Spanish Inquisition that wanted to kill them for what I'm talking about right now. Because they said, no, we cannot believe in the Mass. We have to believe the Bible. And the Catholic Church says, no, you believe the Mass or we burn you at the stake. So I cannot be a Roman Catholic because I cannot believe that you can kill Jesus again. He only died once on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible clearly shows that. Number, number four reason why I cannot be 
a Roman Catholic. Why I'm not a Roman Catholic? Number four reason is because I heed biblical warnings. When the Bible warns me of something, I take that warning and I say, wow, I'll do that. Luke chapter 20 and verse 46. Luke chapter 40 and verse 26 warns me about some things. And one of the things that the Bible warns me about is uh, the priests that walk around and try to tell everybody they're so holy, and yet what do they do? They do evil things. Luke chapter 20, verse 46 says, Beware of the scribes which, do walk, which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. Here are religious hypocrites. And it says, watch out for them, beware of them. What do they do? They walk around in long robes. Probably the funniest and silliest thing about the Catholic Church is that many of the people that are priests walk around in long dresses, and then they dress like a woman in a long dress, and they go around and say, now call me Father. <laughs> what? If any other religion dressed like a woman and then said, call me Father, even though they're dressed like a woman, people would laugh. And yet the Catholic Church has been doing it for thousands of years, and people say, oh, Holy Father. No, no, I'm not going to dress like a woman. I'm going to dress like a man. Beware of people like that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 tells us also to beware of those who make long prayers. This one talked about those who make long prayers for show, to try to show. But this also, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 says, um, I'm in Mark, excuse me. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 warns us about vain repetitions. This is what you call the rosary. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. The rosary. Have you ever heard of a rosary? Well, the rosary is a thing that if you pray, they say God will hear you. And you have to pray it for penance. I got a book one time, and it was in Spanish, and it talked about the rosary. And I read this little book. It was a children's book. And this little children's book showed what the rosary was, and it taught Catholics how to pray the rosary. You're not going to believe this. I didn't believe it until I read it with my own eyes. This is what that little children's book said. It said, here's your rosary. And you go around and you pray the rosary, and you hold these beads in your hand. And it said, you start on the first one, what is it? Uh, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, or something. Um... Uh, but there were three main beads, and you start at the first bead. And when you start at the first bead, you go around and you pray to these six beads. So one time, you pray six times around the rosary, and you come back. Then you move to the second bead, and you pray six times to six beads, and then you come back. This is what the book told you to do, to pray a rosary according to the Catholic Church. And then it said, now you go to the last bead, and you go around and pray six times. And then you start all over and repeat. Do you see? Do you, what? What is that number? What does the Bible say about that number? You're praying the rosary. You're praying 666 every time you do the rosary. That's pretty scary. The Bible warns us about vain repetitions. Praying things, rah, 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 hoping you'll be heard because you said it. I am not a Roman Catholic. Another place in the Bible that talks about Catholicism and it gives us a biblical warning about that false religion. And that's in Ro Revelation chapter 18. I am not a Roman Catholic, don't want to be, can't be. There's just too many things in that church that are tradition rather than Bible. And too many things that point to 666. You had 666 on the Pope's hat when you take the Roman numerals of Vicarius Fidea. You have 666 when you pray the rosary. Uh, it's kind of freaky, man. Uh, I kind of stay away from that. Uh, in Revelation chapter 18, the Bible tells us about a false religious system called Babylon. And it tells us in Revelation 18, verse 4, to come out of that religion. It says, come out of her, my people. Verse 4. Well, let's read the context about that. Let's go to chapter 18, verse 2 through 5, about what the Bible warns us and tells us to do. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power in the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The whole world became rich through this false religious organization. How interesting, because today, very few people have cash and money. Most of them carry a card called a Visa card. And very few people know, even know what Visa stands for. It stands for Vatican International Sales Association. Hmm. So Visa is in charge of the whole world. That's your system of money nowadays for most people. It's just a Visa card. Interesting. It says, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Here's a command to come out from this false religious system. What is this false religious system? Well, chapter 17, one, verse, or one chapter prior, tells us who she is, and it's undeniable who this system is. In Revelation chapter 17, it says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying to me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and seven horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet? Why, that, that's the main colors of the Roman Catholic Church, purple and scarlet. Hmm. And it says, And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Well, the Catholic Church is all about the cup. Why, matter of fact, you can get coins from the Catholic Church, and I've got one. And they sell coins, and on that coin, there's a woman sitting there holding a cup. Interesting. Is there a correlation? And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. Isn't that interesting? She's a whore. And what does the Catholic Church call itself? It calls itself the Mother Church. A Catholic Church is a mother? Interesting. Six, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 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 Does the Catholic Church have any blood on her hands? No. The Catholic Church never killed anybody, did they? Well, there was a thing called the Inquisition. Matter of fact, as you study history from 325 till today, there's been many, many wars. There have been many so-called trials by the Inquisition where many people were murdered for their faith, because they chose not to follow Catholicism, but instead chose to follow the Bible. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church, for years, forbid people from reading the Bible. And they would burn at the stake, or cut the heads off of people that chose to believe and follow God on their own conscience, rather than simply reading and believing the Word of Truth. Could this be who it's speaking about here? In verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And they that dwell on the earth who shall, shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, in verse 9, it says, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the womith, woman sitteth. So this woman that the Bible's talking about, this great whore, this horrible whore that's killed people, is sitting down on seven mountains. And in verse 18, it tells us, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. There is only one city on earth that's known as the city of seven hills, or seven mountains. That city is Rome. Where is the Catholic Church situated? in Rome. Could the Roman Catholic Church be this great whore of Babylon, of which the Bible speaks? I'm not going to say yes or no. You've got to decide that for yourself. But as I read through the scriptures, I, I choose to separate from the Catholic Church. I don't want to be a part of that church. Because I read the Bible and I see the Bible says one thing and that church says another. So I personally told you why I am not a Catholic. Why I personally choose not to accept the doctrines of Roman Catholicism. And thankfully, I live in a country where we have freedom of speech. So yeah, I tolerate them, and I just ask you to tolerate me. If I'd lived 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago in another country, and I spoke like this, I could have got my head cut off. 
because for all throughout time since it started, the Catholic Church has always been a church state religion. And to believe something apart from what the church state of Rome taught, the penalty was death. I thank God that we have an opportunity to read and study and believe what we can from the Bible today. So I tolerate you if you're a Catholic. I'm not trying to convert you. I don't want you to change. If you're a Catholic, be a Catholic and enjoy it. But I am also asking you to tolerate me as well. Let me believe what I want to believe. And what I believe is what the Bible says. And so I personally cannot be a Roman Catholic. Because as I read through the Bible, I see tradition being taught from a church. And yet the Bible saying something entirely different. The last and final reason why I cannot be a Roman Catholic is because I'm saved and I know it. And I know that I'm going to heaven when I die. You see, in the Catholic Church, you can never know that. You can never know in the Catholic Church if you're saved or not, because the Catholic Church teaches salvation is by works. It's something you do. You have to go to confession. You have to go to Mass. You have to do works. You have to pray the rosary. There's a whole list of things that the Catholic Church says you have to do, and they say your salvation depends on whether or not you did those things. It's a gospel of you have to do something to be saved. And then guess what that church says? Now after you've done all these things and you die, guess where you go? You go straight to purgatory. So even though you try your best, you still don't go to heaven when you die. But yet the Apostle Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. As a Bible believer, as a Christian, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved and on my way to heaven when I die. But yet, if I became a Catholic, I could never know that. Because the Catholic Church teaches you can never know where you're going when you die. And if you did good enough, the best you can do, you still won't go to heaven. You end up in purgatory. What? What is purgatory? Well, it's a teaching that they have in which they say it's like hell. Exactly like hell. You go there and you burn. But they say when you burn, you're paying for your sins, and after you've paid enough for your sins, then you get out of purgatory. You want to know how you get out of purgatory according to the Catholic Church? You have to have family or friends go to the Mass. And the more money you pay at the Mass, the sinner their soul comes out of purgatory. Oh yeah, that's what the Catholic Church has taught for centuries, thousands of years is, your loved one's in purgatory. If you want them out, you have to pay for it. There's an old saying, um, high mass, high money. Low mass, low money. And so people have been deceived into thinking, well, my loved ones, they died and went to purgatory, and I've got to pray them out. So you pray the rosary, you pray these things, and your prayers will hopefully liberate their souls from purgatory. Or you can go to the priest and pay lots of money, and the more masses he'll do, the better off they'll be, and eventually they'll come out of purgatory. It's a religion. It's a racket. It's all about money. But you see, in the Bible, it's not like that. In the Bible, you either go to one of two places. You either go to heaven when you die because you've come to Jesus Christ and you've trusted His one sacrifice for all and your sins are forgiven, or you go to hell because you rejected the sacrifice of Christ. You see, I cannot be a Roman Catholic because I'm saved and I know it. And I know that salvation is not by works. It's by faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm saved by faith, not works. You see, the Catholic Church also teaches you that the blood of Jesus is important. But they don't even have the right blood, because in the Catholic Church, the blood of Jesus is the wine of the Mass. But according to the Bible, the blood of Jesus is that saves is not the mass. It's the blood he shed on the cross. And the Bible says when you trust the blood, Ephesians 1, uh, 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I am forgiven through the blood of the cross. Uh, forgive, forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. I know that my sins are forgiven because I have come to Jesus and accepted him as my Savior. I can never know that if I was in the Catholic Church. When I was in Honduras, and by the way, I've run into a lot of Catholics, and uh, as a missionary in Honduras for uh, almost seven years, I came across a lot of Catholics. And one of the things they were told by their church was they can never understand the Bible. 
so they should never read the Bible. Because the church told them that they can't interpret the Bible. Yet the Bible says that the Bible is of no private interpretation. The Bible says what it means, it means what it says, and you can read it and be wise unto salvation. But I was down in Honduras, and I was there visiting a friend of mine in a village way out in the middle of nowhere, and there was a Catholic church in that town. And my friend, who was a Bible believer, saved like me, he said, let's go talk to the priest. And I said, really? You think we'll get anywhere with him? Because the priest believes in his tradition rather than the Bible. He said, no, I know him. He'll let me in. So we did. We went into the Catholic church, sat down and talked to the priest. And we were nice and had a little you know, chit-chat at first. And then I had my Bible there with me. I said, Mr. Priest, I want to ask you a question. I said, I don't want to argue with you. I'm not trying to argue. I just want to ask you a question. I said, do you know when you're go where you're going when you die? I said, you're a religious leader. You look at all these people in this village that come to your church, and you claim to be their leader. Where are you leading them to? Do you, can you even lead them anywhere? Where are you going when you die? He kind of scratched his head, and he looked down, and he said, look. He said, your su pregunta es locura, he told me, which means your question is crazy. And he told me these words. He said, no one can know where they're going until they die, and then they'll know. Is that true? Is that, well, what, what good is living then if we can't know where we're going when we die? Why live good and do good your whole life if it's just going to end you up in hell? Why even try? No, friend, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't say you can't know. The Bible says these things are written unto you that you may know you have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. The Bible was written to us so we might know that we have life. John 17, Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The Word of God shows us how to have eternal life and how to be saved. So I want to close this with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. This is what the Bible calls the gospel. And the gospel is the way of salvation. I know I wrote the word gospel up here someplace, didn't I? Well, it's got to be there someplace. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And according to the gospel, you can be saved by the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ trusting what Jesus did. There is salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. It's through the Scriptures, and it's through the Gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you to the Gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and how he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So the Bible is what Jesus Christ did. He died, was buried, and rose again. And you can be saved by believing that Gospel, by trusting. It's not this, called the Mass, when they do it. You can't trust in it when they do it. You have to trust in what he did. I've yet to meet a Catholic that knew where he was going when he died. All they can do is say, well, I just hope I did good enough. It's not good enough. God did enough, and if you trust what Jesus did, he'll forgive you, and you'll be completely and totally forgiven of all sins. That's what's so great about the Bible, is it teaches complete forgiveness, and in no soul salvation, you can know you're saved and on your way to heaven. So this has been a message, just simply, why I am not a Roman Catholic. Why am I not a Roman Catholic? Because I've studied that church and its history, and I found out that according to the Bible, it's not what it claims to be. Peter is not the first pope. There's no such thing as a pope in the Bible. Matter of fact, Peter was married, and popes today are said you can't marry. Peter did not go to Rome. He went to Babylon. We don't worship a man. The title Holy Father is not the title of a man. It's the title of God. The Mass is not found in the Bible. In the Bible, Jesus Christ died one time, one sacrifice, forever, for all sins. And yet they try to do it over and over. I can't pray the rosary. Praying the rosary is praying 666 over and over. I can't be celibate when the Bible tells me as a minister I have a right to be married, and I should be. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. We looked at the verses where she had at least six other children after she gave birth to Jesus Christ. She was a sinner. That's why she had a sacrifice for her sins. Everything that the Catholic Church teaches 
it teaches from tradition rather from the scriptures. So I hope this has been a blessing to you today. And if nothing else, I hope it gets you to study. You have a right to read the Bible. You should read the Bible. Don't let a church or a denomination or anyone tell you, oh, you can't read the Bible because you won't understand it. The Bible says you should read it, and God will help you understand it. So thank you for watching this video. This is personally why I'm not a Catholic. If you are, that's great. I hope you watch this all the way to the end. At least you get my perspective, because I see your perspective. I've seen it firsthand as a missionary on the foreign field. And I see the fruit of Catholicism. It leaves a person never knowing where they're going when they die. And yet, through the Scripture, you can be wise unto salvation. You can be saved by simply believing what God said and trusting the Gospel. Thank you for watching this. Come back every week at cloudchurch.org. We have a new sermon in English and Spanish. We'd love to see you again. God bless.